it has gone into uh, it has gone into um, uh, more 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 contractual okay, are, arrangements with the country. We are, we are going live. Okay, I guess we're ready. Okay. Um, we are going live. Okay, I guess we're ready. Okay. Hello and welcome to Conversations in Ideas. The Horn of Africa region is home to some of the most fragile states in the world. According to the Fragile States Index 2017 by the Energy of Fund for Peace, the Horn of Africa region has the highest concentration of extremely fragile states in the world, with Sudan, with South Sudan, the world's newest state, uh, ranking uh, on first, which is the, the highest fragile state, Somalia the second, Sudan the fifth, Ethiopia the 15th, Eritrea 19th, and Kenya 22nd. Uh, a complex and diverse region of considerable geopolitical significance. The change in the region seems to have mirrored the change in the geopolitics of the world. Apart from the transnational concerns in relation to peace, security, and development, the fragility of state institutions will have massive consequences for the people in these countries. Uh, it would have political risks, it would have economic shocks, uh, it would, uh, going forward, uh, have considerable consequences, not just for the people in the region, but also uh, beyond. So what does what does this mean? And what are some of the causes? Why do we have fragility of state in the region uh, for such a long period of time? To discuss these issues, I am joined by uh, two individuals with particular expertise uh, on these teams uh, from Washington, D.C., Ambassador uh, Herman Cohen, uh, Ambassador Herman Cohen is a former uh, U.S. Assistant Secretary of State, uh, and he was the key uh, U.S. diplomat uh, behind the post Derg uh, transition uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, we also joined from Kenya uh, by Mr. Farah Malin. Uh, Mr. Farah uh, is former Deputy Speaker of Kenya's uh, National Parliament. Uh, he is uh, very active in the politics of Kenya and the whole of Africa region. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking your time to join me uh, today to discuss these important uh, issues. Uh, if I could start uh, with you, uh, Ambassador Cohen, um, this region has seen such intractable problems, uh, political problems, uh, for such a long period of time. Uh, you have worked in the region, you have been a key player at one particular moment, uh, on behalf of the most powerful state in the world. What do you think are some of the structural and systemic issues behind uh, uh, this extreme fragility of almost every state in that region? Well, I wouldn't say every state. Uh, you have Kenya, of course, where our colleague is coming from. That's a very stable country. I, I think uh, one of the problems is cultural. Uh, I keep telling my friends that the Middle East doesn't stop at the Red Sea. The Middle East continues on to uh, Egypt, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. You know, the languages they speak there are all what they call Semitic languages. So you do have sort of a Middle East mentality of a zero-sum game. You know, compromise is very difficult. And... Uh, there's a tendency to have uh, what I call minority rule. Uh, in uh, Ethiopia, for example, uh, ever since the end of the Second World War, when Ethiopia was freed from Italian occupation, it's always been uh, dominated by one ethnic group, or the, either the Amhara and then replaced now by the, the, the Tigrayan group. It, it's a, it's a single, single ethnic group rule, which is difficult to break. Mm. Uh, and it means uh, the absence of uh, participation by others who become resentful. You see. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's true uh, not only in Ethiopia, it's true in Sudan, where you have uh, 
minority uh, in Sudan, the Arab speaking people are a minority in Sudan. The Muslims are a majority, but the Arab speaking people are a minority. So the real majority in Sudan are people who speak African languages. Uh, this is what the late John Garang was saying. He said the, the Africans should uh, really rule Sudan, whether they're Muslims or Christian. See? So I think it's the, the, whole, uh, the whole framework of minority rule, monopolizing power, I think is the greatest problem. Uh, Somalia, before it, it broke down in 1991, it was ruled by one of the major clans. And, and the other clans felt left out. That's why you had the, the failed state mm -hmm. uh, with the other clans coming in and their inability for many years to agree, to agree on a new framework for governing the country. So my personal feeling is the cultural aspect is the most important. Right, right. Um, Mr. Farah, um, Ambassador Kohen said um, the problem is mostly uh, cultural. Uh, would you agree with that assessment? What, what is your take uh, on some of these sort of structural systemic issues that sustain this fragility? Uh, actually, I, 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 I must, I must uh, say to Ambassador Cohen, I have uh, seen more or less in the same prism that he has seen the politics of the Horn of Africa, the Greater Horn of Africa. Uh, like what he has claimed is basically the Semitic, you know, axis. In Ethiopia, it is the Amara Tigray, which has dominated the politics and the government of that part of the world for centuries and, and subjugated the, the, all the other, the Oromos, the Somalis, the Banishangul Gambela, the Afars, the, I mean, too many other nationalities that are there. And and it's it's like it was a form of a racism. You must you must you must admit this because there, there's a history to it. Uh, and and when we got independence, there were two critical uh, institutions that should have been improved. One, uh, the production uh, uh, levels of the African continent had to be improved. Africa had to do. Uh, uh, to produce more, not just be a consuming uh, continent and a continent for raw materials, but um, a continent that also produces, adds value to its own raw materials, and, and, and at the same time is able to move like the other countries, like the so-called uh, the, 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 the Asian tigers. The other area that had to be improved was to build institutions of politics that were supposed to try and not reinvent the wheel all over again, but to try and borrow from the best practices and have democracy, human rights, the will of the people. I mean, those kind of things. The mistake that was done, and this uh, courtesy of the developed world those days, the former colonial powers, was that they put in the political headquarters of the African continent in Addis Ababa which essentially was a, a feudal racist state where the Amara Tigray Semitic treated everybody else as a lesser human. And also put in the economic engine of the continent through the Economic Commission for Africa in Addis Ababa. So we started on the wrong foot from the word go. And, and we failed to build institutions that were going to uh, basically compete in this modern age. We, we, we went back more or less into a primordial state in which uh, the, the stronger you are, the more you wield the power, the more uh, what you call the gambot, gambot diplomacy. Uh, so then, of course, the former sergeant majors, the regimental sergeant majors who worked in the British and the French and the other, like Idi Amin, like Bedel Bokassa and others, and many others came into. So dictatorship became again the norm. And with the, with the divide, the East-West divide, as long as somebody was, was closer to the capitalist West, then everything else goes in his country. And, and the same also on the other end. So it is cultural. It is the, the inability for us to start off well, the inability for us to build institutions and, 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 and the support those dictators and kleptomaniacs uh, got from the Western world. I mean, without, without the Americans and the British and the French, Mobutu Sese Soko would not have done what he did. And that goes for every other dictator. Right. So either by, by, by omission or commission, there has been a massive uh, input in 
maintaining this fragility and failed states in Africa from the so-called developed world. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, uh, Mr. Farr. Uh, Ambassador, Mr. Farr's point is that there is obviously the urge to dominate uh, between various groups. Um, this relationship of domination and equality is pretty much justified and legitimized uh, through cultural practices uh, that existed uh, within those very societies. Uh, so at some level, there are cultural problems that help us sustain the kind of fragility that we see because everyone that comes to power will never leave power unless there is a violent confrontation that ultimately leads to that. Uh, but he also alluded to a much broader structural problem uh, that is not necessarily confined to that region, that sort of uh, brings in broader geopolitical considerations, such as, for example, uh, US European support. Um, also in, in, in Ethiopia, we had uh, Soviet support uh, at, at some point. Uh, to what extent do you think are those broader geopolitical considerations help it sustain the kind of problem that we are talking about? Well, I, I'm not sure I understand the meaning of the word support. If, uh, say, the United States, uh, France, and UK did not have uh, normal diplomatic relations with every authoritarian ruler in the world, we might have five embassies, that's all. There's so many authoritarian governments, we, but we still must deal with them. We have interests in those countries. They, we have mutual interests. So we have to deal with them. So, so I think the word support is not an adequate word. Uh, for example, Mobutu Sese Seko, whom I knew very well, uh, we kept encouraging him to democratize. I remember a conversation that, uh, that Secretary of State James Baker had with him in 1990, just after Namibian independence, uh, saying, look, uh, democracy is the way the world is going. If you don't do that, if you don't go for democracy, you will be swept away. And he said, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. And he, he said, we will no longer have a one-party state. We will have multi-party. And uh, he allowed parties to, to flourish. But what he really did is he spent a lot of money creating parties that would be just satellites of his own party. So I, I, I don't accept the word support. We have to deal with all countries as, as uh, I remember when I was stationed in Kinshasa, uh, I was complaining about Mobutu to the French ambassador who was much more senior than I. Uh, his name was Casiasco Morizé. He eventually became ambassador to Washington. So I said, Mr. Ambassador, how can we deal with someone like Mobutu? He's impossible. He said, my son, we diplomats, we must deal with what exists. We can't change everything the way we want it. So I, I, I don't like the word support. I just feel that we must deal with governments and we must encourage them to do the right thing. And I think we, to a certain extent, we've succeeded in many places. Mm. Uh, people would look at, for example, I mean, I, I think we can talk about um, contemporary examples in Ethiopia, for example, um, uh, where uh, the regime in power, where everyone knows for sure that it is not representative. Uh, the US government knows it. The State Department continued to put out reports on the extent of human rights violations every year. Those reports chronicle uh, extensive abuses uh, by the government, uh, but nevertheless, the Ethiopian government continued to receive financial support, technical support, including, for example, the US uh, government helping the Ethiopian uh, um, intelligence authorities build, for example, surveillance infrastructure. Now, these are in some cases justified in terms of security collaboration, but those same uh, uh, instruments were mobilized by the Ethiopian government against the political opposition that are based both at home and abroad. Um, so, so when you have facts such as this, uh, why would it be wrong for people to describe this as, as a form of support? Well, I guess you can if you like, uh, but you must remember that democracy and human rights are something we would like to encourage, but there are other interests. There are many other interests. One of them is security, one, 
There's the fight against Al-Shabaab in Somalia and the Ethiopian uh, security forces are important there. Uh, one can argue that the Ethiopian government would like to build up the threat of Al-Shabaab in order to, to continue having the rest of the world forget about human rights. That, that's one argument I have heard and it has a certain amount of credibility. Uh, and, uh, but the US government keeps saying, we keep talking to the Ethiopians about human rights and we keep pressing them. And I know a lot of my Ethiopian friends here in Washington, and there are many of them, they keep saying, why, why don't you place sanctions on them? Why don't you do all sorts of bad things to them? Well, that's also a possibility. But I think we have to weigh the different interests in the region. There are economic interests as well. Uh, Ethiopians, are, we have a problem with Ethiopia and uh, Egypt over the big dam that the Ethiopians are building. So we have to weigh these different issues and not put 100% of our effort into the human rights issue. issue. We, but we have to pay attention to it and put pressure on the government to reform. And when there is a tension between human rights, uh, democracy in Ethiopia and US interest, uh, you would think that obviously US interest would trump uh, those considerations. Generally, yes, of course, every government uh, gives priority to its own interests. Uh, Unfortunately, we wish we can give priority to the interests of the common people in every country, but it doesn't always work that way. But I must say, we do not ignore human rights. Every visitor, uh, President Obama went there and talked about human rights. Uh, so we do not ignore it, as some countries do ignore it. Right, right. Uh, Mr. Farah, let me come uh, to you. Um, you once described Ethiopia as a failed state. Uh, what do you mean by that? Why is a country uh, that has one of the most uh, strong military in the in the region, uh, actually in the continent as well, um, a government that has managed to uh, ensure certain level of uh, stability, uh, peace, not only in the country but also in the region? Why? What do you mean when you say Ethiopia is a failed state? You see, when uh, the ordinary institutions, I mean, there are three critical institutions or arms of the government in any, any civilized modern state, in my opinion. One is a rule of law. Rule of law um, is not ruled by law, but it's a rule of law where everybody is supposed to conform to the law. And if you don't conform to the law, then you face the full force of the law. It doesn't matter whether you are the, the king or you are the most ordinary person there. And then there is what you call political accountability when you can hold free and fair elections and say, you can only govern the people by, the, by their own consent. And, 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 and finally, you have an impersonal state, impersonal state in, in that you, you don't, you don't uh, you're not there by a certain right. You are there by meritocracy. People who get employed, people who get into positions and all these things are there because they deserve that and they have the best qualifications for that. Now, when none of those ones works, uh, it's, in Ethiopia, it's a rule by law. I mean, you have a military. Uh, it's an occupation military that occupies its own nation. It, it, it subjugates and, and, and destroys and kills and carries out pogroms on its own population. And it is managed and run by a minority uh, group. I mean, Ethiopia is, uh, I don't know whether any census has been conducted lately, but I think the population is anything from 100 million. But you have 3.5 3 million to 4 million Tigrayans who have basically held the country as a hostage and who have carried out genocides and massacres in every area of the country because they have the firepower. And then when you look at the, the meritocracy in there, uh, I'm told there's over 100 generals from only that small ethnic community. And the rest of the country there is basically uh, and, and not there. When it comes to the rule of law, when it comes to the, the, the capitalist orientation that lately they have tried to open to, you look at Mekele and look at the Tigray province and look at the rest of the country, it's, it's different. So it, it's failed state in the sense that the people only lack the power to be able to rise up against it and they've already risen up against it uh, to be able to turn it because for you to be a failed state is when the institutions don't work 
it, when you are when you have an occupation of your own country using your own brute force, that is not a, a state. I know it has got a. You can have a militia. The American military is so powerful that it can occupy many countries, and but but then it can't occupy those many countries, and because it has the firepower, uh, it cannot be legitimately said that they have formed a government anywhere in the world, other than their own country, which has basically got institutions and 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 this uh, democracy there. So I say it's a failed state because it's not there by the consent of the people to begin with. The government is not there by the consent of the people. It is a minority state. It is there using the brute force on a daily basis. There's no law and order. There's no meritocracy. So I, for all practical purposes, it's an a, a implosion at the moment. I think the implosion have already started. Uh, right. It's just a matter of seeing how it, it, it has the effect it has both inside and outside Ethiopia. Mm. So well, I think... We will zoom in on Ethiopia a little bit later, uh, but I, I want this to be, at least this first part, to be a broader reflection on, on, on the region. Um, I just want to use this uh, particular point that uh, Mr. Farah made, uh, Ambassador. Um, he, his point is that Ethiopia is a, a failed state, uh, one, because the government is not representative, uh, there is no uh, human rights, rule of law, um, and the government essentially maintains its power through the use of uh, force. Uh, now, would you agree with that characterization, with the characterization that Ethiopia is a failed state? Uh, first of all, I agree with everything that uh, our colleague says about Ethiopia. I, I couldn't dispute any one of his facts. I would not, however, put it in the definition of a failed state. My personal definition is where the government does not control the lands, does not control the territory. For example, Somalia after Siad Barre fell in 1991, different parts of Somalia were controlled by warlords and there was no comprehensive uh, national control. That is how I would define a failed state. However, I agree with everything he says about Ethiopia. I might ask, well, we can talk about Ethiopia later, but one thing that tells me that Ethiopia is, is, is is not really a fully functioning state, is the, the fact that they must import food when the rainy season is bad, at least once every five years. A true democracy will never have that. They will make provision for stocking food or for transporting food from one productive area to another. Ethiopia has never been able to do that. So that tells me that to a certain extent, the government is failing to be a state to all of the territory. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there are a number of variables and, and indicators, uh, I think, that um, uh, that shows that the government is uh, in some people. We'll, we'll talk about some of those uh, a little bit later. Uh, now, w when you look at the region broadly, um, as I said earlier, uh, South Sudan is the most fragile state in the world. Somalia is the second most fragile. Um, Eritrea has its own uh, problems, although uh, at least on this index that I mentioned, um, Eritrea seems to be doing well uh, than Ethiopia. Uh, Kenya is not doing well either. Kenya is on the 21st, uh, on, on the 22nd. Uh, now the question is, where does this lead the region? Uh, what, what are some of the risks for the population who live in the region, but also for um, other actors beyond the region because um, the effects of uh, state fragility, state failure cannot be confined to those particular areas. The effects are transnational. Security is a transnational issue. Peace is a transnational issue. So the question is, what would be the, the impact of this for the population? Uh, and then uh, as, as a second question, uh, what does that mean for powerful states with an interest in the region? Ambassador. Well, uh... The, uh, the problems within states can, uh, can go over borders. Uh, that, that's certainly true. Uh, we see that in, uh, in Somalia, where you have the terrorists, uh, the Al-Shabaab terrorists, uh, attacking targets inside of Kenya, uh, inside of Uganda. So instability in one state inevitably spills over across the border. Uh, I believe that the South Sudan... Uh, Problems in South Sudan are spilling over into the Democratic Republic of the Congo and 
other countries on the border. So uh, instability, unrest, uh, inability of the government really to govern uh, invariably has no borders. It has no borders. It, it, it causes problems elsewhere, including, say, the absence of trade. Uh, for example, the, uh, the trade between Eritrea and Ethiopia before the 1998 war was quite flourishing. In fact, uh, they had to get the IMF to set up a currency exchange mechanism so that the people selling in Durr and then in Natfa could have their accounts settled at the end of every week. Uh, but after the 98 war, all of that commerce stopped. There's no cross-border commerce. So that, that is, has a profound effect on people. And if you look at why some of these young men in Eritrea are leaving, crossing the dangerous deserts of Libya and the Mediterranean Sea, where many of them are dying, it's because they can't get a job. They can't get a job. They've been interviewed by Human Rights Watch. 90% of them say, I left Eritrea because I can't get a job, you see. So all of this lack of good governance mm. or discriminatory governance invariably has an impact on the neighbors. And this entire immigration business coming from throughout that region is impacting heavily in Europe. Look at the politics of Europe now. Uh, countries are going from sort of moderate democracies into hard right-wing authoritarian tendencies in Poland and Romania and Bulgaria because they can't stop the immigrants, you see. So it, everything is interchangeable. Mm. Mm. And, and to the extent that um, some of these regimes were one way or another supported by, by the West, both the US and, and Europeans, um, and over a long period of time since independence, uh, this, most of these countries had um, highly repressive uh, governments, and those repressive governments were uh, aided and abated uh, by external actors. Um, and the consequence now is a huge number of people uh, leaving their countries, uh, in some cases uh, flying from uh, repression, in some cases seeking better life, uh, and that is now destabilizing Europeans themselves. Doesn't that say something about Western policy towards authoritarian governments? Earlier you said that uh, um, every country has its own national interest, uh, and therefore most cases would act consistently with their national interest. But I think uh, the, the effects of prioritizing short-term uh, policy consideration, national interest is precisely something of this sort. Um, what, what, do you, what do you say about that? Well, let me say, I don't think that what Western governments do in these regions causes the problem. I think what you're alluding to is if we only had different policies or if we applied sanctions or if we had no relations at all, all these problems would go away. That's totally untrue. The problems are caused by internal issues in those countries. Now you can say, well, the West should not, should have different policies in order to encourage them to change. But I don't think you, you have a tendency to blame the Western countries for all these problems. And I have to remind you that the US and Eritrea have had very bad relations since the war of 1998. Right. Uh, Susan Rice, who was our assistant secretary and then ambassador to the UN, she and uh, Isaias Afawerki hate each other. And, I and she is the one who proposed sanctions against Eritrea uh, at the UN. But yet she, that hasn't changed Eritrea because- she, she's, a close, she's a close friend of Melazi Nawi as well. She was a very close friend of Melazi Nawi. And as one of my taxi cab drivers said, Melis died and took the password with him. See? Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so she, uh, well, I don't want to digress about her, but her attitude in foreign policy was good people and bad people. Mm. You can't run foreign policy on the basis of who's good and has bad, but it's on what are our interests, what are their interests, how do they coincide, how do they collide with each other, you see. Mm. So he said, whatever Mellis can do is good, whatever Kagami does is good, whatever Isaias does is bad, you see. Or yeah, but, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. We don't, the Western countries do not cause these problems. 
Well, what you're saying is maybe we're making them worse. I, I wouldn't agree with that. Mm. No, I think my, my point is, uh, and I think this is also uh, a point that most people uh, share, uh, it, it's not that the West would want authoritarian governments or authoritarian uh, leaders to thrive in that region. It's just that they don't do enough. I, I don't think most people are asking for some form of sanction or some form of direct intervention from the West to impose democracy. All people are saying is that the West is enabling, it's making it possible by providing material assistance to these repressive regimes in order for these regimes to actually thrive uh, in, in, in those areas. Uh, Amba, um, Mr. Farah, I want to come to you. Um, as we were saying, um, there is a massive problem of uh, institutional uh, failure in this in these regions. Uh, in most countries, there is not even a political will to create an institution that are independent, can deliver justice, can hold the governments accountable. Well, what do you think would be the consequence of continued state fragility for the people across the region? Also, what would be the consequence of this for uh, those with political interest on the region? To begin with, um, I, I, I want to tell you that uh, I don't want to say that most of the problems that we suffer as a continent is as a result of what the West does. But, but clearly, without, without, without the support of the West, without the American support to the Ethiopian regime, the Ethiopian minority regime of Melezrau, which is almost $3 billion, $2.5 to $3 billion in a year, in grant, free money, not loans, and 1,200,000 tons of cereals to feed the Ethiopian people. That regime would not last. It would not have lasted at all, at all. And then you look at Eritrea, which is next door, you might not have, well, it doesn't have any democratic institutions the same way uh, Ethiopia doesn't have any democratic institutions, or even, even a semblance of it. This is, just, this is just a pretense. But Eritrea is not on any food aid. They've been able to feed their people in its entirety. And, and secondly, they have, this is the only country in the Horn of Africa which has uh, achieved its Millennium Goals 4 and 5. And, and here is the Americans putting sanctions on it and fighting it tooth and nail. They won the case on the border dispute with Ethiopia. In the same West which is supposed to tell us how we should respect the laws or the rule of law is not able to respect the, the, the rule of what was ruled or rather the judgment that was delivered by the International Court. So Obama one time said, we don't want Africa to be a continent of strong men. We want it to be a continent of strong institutions. But you know, they're not supporting those institutions. On the contrary, they're supporting uh, every effort to try and, 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 and not allow those institutions to, to take hold. Because when you support the counter narrative, when you support the likes of Meles and Kagame, the way you put it right now, and many other strongmen who want to stay there forever, then of course you don't give a chance to the institutions of democracy, of human rights, of the rule of law, and all these good institutions. Now the other bit is that we 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 make all sorts of efforts as a continent through the intelligentsia, the scholars, and everybody else to see if we can get proper hearing in the rest of the world. By the way, democracy is not, is not one event called an election every five years, which is rigged, because there's no election that takes place in this part of the, of the world that is free, fair, credible, and, and, and transparent. And, and these are the kind of areas. Look at our elections, for example. John Kerry comes to Kenya the other day and, and, and gives it a clean bill of health. Turns out later on that this clean of bill of health was, not, was, was misplaced. And, and never do good enough again. So give one side the thumbs up and then give the other side the thumbs up. Then you wonder what exactly is it that these major powers want? I, I was part of the team that negotiated uh, the settlement on the coalition government by and large in, in, in 2008, 2009, 2007, 2008, when we had the post-election violence in Kenya. And I remember Jendai Fraser coming in to us here. And, 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 and she came to us and she told me, you have your rights. I clearly agree with you, you people are right. 
Uh, but I'm here for the interests of the American state and American government. I'm not here for your own interests. It's for you to fight for your rights. She goes and does the same narrative also to the other side. So effectively, you see a situation in which superpowers themselves are playing the game of, 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 of making these sides fight one another, taking a position with one side and then taking with the other side, emboldening every side so that we progressively go towards confrontation, civil wars, uh, you know, basically failed states, so this essentially has been has been the 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 the, the modus operandi of of the Western world. I can tell you one other thing. What I can tell you is that in the 60s and the 70s, when the Soviet bloc was a strong communist bloc, and the Warsaw Pact those days, for an African dictator to survive, he had to shout that he is being undermined by communists. And if there are no communists there, then you create a, a communist yourself and create that threat and shout wolf. Then the Americans and the British and the French and all of them will come to you for you to subjugate and destroy your people. The same is happening right now. I don't think Al-Shabaab is such a strong force that cannot be eliminated in a matter of weeks, if not months. But having uh, 20, 22,000 uh, forces from from, from from Ethiopia, having it from uh, uh, Uganda, Kenya, uh, and, and Burundi, and not being able to sort out that problem, not even engaging them seriously, and also having American firepower out in the Atlantic force and from uh, uh, the, the other, the other what they call uh, equipment that they have in the sea there. I don't think anybody wants to get rid of that al-Shabaab. If anything, I have a strong feeling that Mel has cooperated with them and wants to help the the thriving of Al-Shabaab and even the subsequent government, so that the, the thing can flow, the aid can flow. He cannot be held accountable to a free and fair elections, or they cannot be held now the state that is still there after he's gone. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you wonder people with such a powerful intelligence, the CIA, the MI6, MI5, and the rest of them would not know the basic information that is known by a man in the streets of Nairobi and Addis Ababa and Mogadishu. I don't believe that myself. So I think, in a sense, it is, as Ambassador Cohen puts it, they're there for their own interests. And their interest also dictates that the, the failed states probably is, is a phenomenon that can help them uh, access our own raw materials. Look at what, can, what is happening right now in, in Congo. Uh, I mean, the entire, the, most, the, the, the richest country in, in, in natural resources right now is up for grabs by, 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 by Western hitmen there who are taking its coltan, it is diamond, it is... Uh, the, the, the gold, it is wood, uh, wood that is as old as hundreds of years. I mean, that is all now happening in there. So in a sense, I, I can tell you that, uh, as, as Ambassador puts it, that they're there for their own interests, and that interest outweighs the interests of these African countries, particularly in the Horn of Africa. And I, I, me, I don't know when we'll get out of it. Let, let, let me ask you one thing here. So, so if this is based on... Um, you know, calculations of uh, interest and, and uh, power. Uh, why did the West, with all the technological, the intelligence capacity at their disposal, why did they have not been able to see the long-term consequences of this support, uh, as, as we were calling it? Um, uh, as you can see, Europeans are now paying very dearly. You see, one of the one of the most uh, I, I can see Ambassador Cohen is in, involved in the energy sector, private energy sector in many countries in Africa. I know Jendai Fraser is also doing her own business. She, she stays most of her time in Kenya here, and she's doing business in all the the countries in the region here. I remember Tony Blair being an advisor to uh, Muammar Gaddafi sometimes back when he left uh, his own post as the Prime Minister of uh, the UK. So in, in a sense, the, that interest, whether it's at the personal level or it's at the national level or a national you know, interest, is, is, is playing out even in a more bold fashion right now as it was playing out in the 60s and the early 70s. Uh, because because uh, you, I mean, this, these things are there. Uh, we thought that by when these countries collapse, then these refugees flock to the Mediterranean Sea and to the European ports and American ports. The West is going to see the need for them to have stable governments in those places and create economic conditions or rather help in the creation of economic conditions 
that will, uh, will, 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 will deter most of the people from taking those perilous and very dangerous, what you call a, a journeys to, to other ports in the world. But I don't think that's happening right now. I don't think at all. Look at Syria, what's happening in Syria right now. There is still no deliberate intention on both sides of the two superpowers to stop this thing. It's still a zero-sum game. Everybody wants to win. So, so I, I, I can only tell you that Africa being the, the last continent, and a virgin continent for that matter, with a lot of uh, resources, uh, the, the long-term interest, in my opinion, look at the co- cost of Somalia. If you, if you have a stable government in Somalia, then those trawlers there that come from all the major powers in the world that are scooping the Somali fish at a rate that you can never imagine, the resources that would have lasted the Somalis for hundreds of years, is being depleted at the rate of you know you can, unimaginable rates, and, right. and it also goes it also goes for the other natural resources. I mean, how many of them right now do have concessions there? Every government that comes uh, with a little bit of greasing hands of the, those leaders left and they're able to get all that. So there is a scramble for the long term resources of the of the continent, mm-hmm. and somehow it has dawned on the major powers that it's better for this country, this, this states to be fragile or to be failed than for them to be stable because maybe the benefits they'll get out of that are far outweighs the other the other the other way around. Right. I know Ambassador Cohen himself at the personal level is a very, very I've read about him. I've seen how much dedicated he is to the Horn of Africa, particularly Somalia and Ethiopia and the conflicts that are there. And I, I want to commend him, but but I can assure you there are very many leaders and former leaders from the Western world who have their own hands and and, and pockets also deep into the continent here. Ambassador Cohen, is this conspiracy theory or is there a grain of credibility uh, or truth here? Well, when you talk about who is plundering the resources, who do I see? I don't see the United States. We do oil and we we give the revenues to the countries and what they do with it is, is not up to us. But who is plundering the resources? China is plundering. They are the ones whose ships are on both sides of Africa illegally taking the fish. It's not American boats. It's not British or French boats that are doing that. Now, who is taking diamonds from Eastern Congo and uh, the Coltan? It's the Chinese. And nobody mentions them uh, because, uh, I don't know, for somehow we romanticize the Chinese, you see. So I, I, don't, I don't think the, they are, they are the late coming. is guilty of, of doing any plundering of resources. When the West takes resources, they do it legitimately and they provide revenues to the host governments. Uh, look at the Congo. There was a U.S. company called... Um, Freeport McMoran was mining the richest copper mine in the world in, in central Congo called Tenki Fungurume had two and a half percent copper, which is, it, it's amazingly rich. They built one of the most successful operations with schools, with homes for the workers, with adequate food supplies and health and all that. Now it's take, they sold it to the Chinese uh, I'm wondering what's that going to become. The Chinese never promote people into management uh, positions. They treat the workers horribly and they treat them just like they treat their own Chinese workers. So why don't we look to China first before we start putting blame? Mm. Um, I, 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 I agree. I agree with Ambassador Cohen. I mean, it's the, the Chinese influence right now in Africa is so horribly skewed and so terribly skewed that unless we get the support of our other nations in the world and we, 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 we begin having a, a volt fast change in the manner in which we approach them, they will, they will take away everything because they can bring in prisoners, they can bring in everybody, the way they treat their own people. Uh, you can imagine how well they will treat us here. It's even worse than that. Mm-hmm. Look, at, look at Angola right now where the Chinese are even doing hawking in the streets. And, I, 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 and, and I'm sure in another 10, 15 years' time, you will see a new race in that place that's basically going to be a very, I don't know what name is going to be given to that race, but, but yes, go um, on. I'm, I'm sure the uh, Chinese uh, engagement uh, with the region is, is something of a, a very considerable concern to a lot of people. Um, this is a power that doesn't even pretend 
uh, to care about some of these values that we are talking about. Um, I, I don't know if it, if it is um, better to have uh, a power that somewhat pretends to care about human rights and democracy, uh, but uh, doesn't exert the necessary pressure, uh, doesn't use its power and authorities to influence so that uh, countries uh, improve, um, or countries like China, uh, who publicly state that human rights and democracy are not part of the game. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, we can uh, we can uh, talk about this for hours and hours. I want to I want to focus on um, Eritrea and, and Kenya. As I said, according to this index, Kenya is the 22nd most fragile state in the world. Eritrea 19th, uh, Ethiopia stands at 15th. Um, our impression of Eritrea is, um, broadly speaking, a very uh, repressive, closed country um, that doesn't have a constitution, um, does not really um, even pretend to respect human rights, uh, democracy, and so on and so forth. Um, Ethiopia does have a very vibrant constitution um, as a matter of uh, a written text, uh, but the practices are very much the opposite on the, the negation of the kinds of things the government says it is committed to publicly. So we have a contradiction there. Um, on the other end, in Kenya, uh, we have a, what looks like a fairly vibrant state with a very good uh, media. Um, I think the media has been uh, fairly good compared to other countries for a very long time. Um, the civic organizations are far more stronger uh, than these regional countries, but, but stands at 22nd. I was shocked to find that number. Well, what explains this phenomenon, Eritrea uh, ranking better than Ethiopia, very close to Kenya, and, and Kenya, what, a country that looks very stable uh, and, and somewhat uh, have democratic institutions where the Supreme Court recently um, uh, went as far as uh, nullifying the election. What, what explains this phenomenon? How is Kenya considered that unstable? Uh, Mr. Farah, if, could, if I could start from, from you. I, I, I can tell you, uh, family, uh, the, the power elites who are also now the economic elites in these countries. But by the way, uh, I, 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 I've been to Eritrea many times myself. I have seen how it's it's probably the safest country in the region. It's it's a place you could walk from your hotel at three o'clock in the morning and walk to any part of it without any fear that you'd be mugged or there's going to be a crime. I can't do that in Nairobi. I can't walk out of my house here. Anything can happen the moment you leave your own home. And then I haven't seen that. I haven't seen beggars in the streets of Asmara. Uh, I've been to Addis Ababa and it's it's you can understand what it looks like there. The same also with Kenya. So you might not get very many people who are extremely wealthy like Kenya and Ethiopia are. Uh, and I don't think there's anybody who's wealthy in, in, in Eritrea. They're probably only comfortable. But but yeah, other than the, the failure for it to have these uh, elections every five years, it's probably the best run country right now where education is free, health is free. There is a, 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 a social security for the elderly. Anybody above the age of 65, I think, has certain stipends. Now, we have a problem in Kenya. There's no doubt about that. We have never had a free and fair elections in this country, except when it was conducted by the British colonial government in 1962 and in the one of 2002. Every other election has been massively rigged in favor of the power elite. So when we did very well in 2002, we thought we were going to keep on improving. We have backslided. We have backslided. I mean, the... Uh, Democracy is uh, uh, and human rights and all those things were better off uh, some four years, five years, six years back than we, they are right now here. Uh, I, I know we have a problem. Uh, Kenya is not a failed state right now, but very close to being a failed state uh, because of all these problems. And uh, the effect of all these things, it's just a question of one successful uprising happening in any of these countries is going to be like a domino effect the way it was in the Arab Spring in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And I can assure you, is we are just waiting for the time, but I don't think it's going to be long in waiting. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's Ethiopia, whether it is Sudan, whether it is uh, Somalia, 
whether it's East Uganda, by the way, which is another terrible case, terrible, terrible case, undoubtedly, where you have that militarized democracy. The same guys who were in uniform before now have taken over both the, 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 the capital of the country as well as the political power because these thing, two things go together. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if you ask me what do you think, what the future holds, the future is very gleam in my opinion, unless something drastic happens in the reverse direction. Mm -hmm. It's very, very grim in my opinion. Mm. Uh, Ambassador Cohen, how, how do you assess uh, this situation? What explains Eritrea's uh, situation? It, 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 at least in terms of the sort of general perception that exists about Eritrea uh, in the region also uh, uh, globally, it, it seems to be doing well. Well, Eritrea, well, remember at the beginning I talked about cultural problems. There are certain groups that feel that they must dominate, even though they may be minority. Uh, Eritrea does not have that because it's pretty much of uh, the population is the same. Everyone is the same. And on top of that, you have a political regime that's based on the theories of Mao Zedong. Uh, Isaias Afwerki was trained in China of Mao Zedong. And even today, if you talk to him, he'll say, I regret the passing of Mao Zedong because he had the best system even though, it, even though it was very poor. And, and he, for him, control is important. Order is very important. And also everyone is the same. There is no discrimination against anyone, which is, which is a very good thing. And also more and more now, the, uh, the private sector is being encouraged. You have very important Canadian investments there in the mining, you have investments in the ports of uh, Asab and Masawa by the, by the Emirate countries. Uh, mineral, more and more minerals are being developed. So Isaias may be a Maoist, but he believes that money, we can make money through private investments. So you have a good combination of very good order, not law and order, but order and opening to the private sector and also a homogenous population where there's no jealousy. Everybody, everybody is of the same ethnic group, you see. Mm. Uh, some of the uh, Canadian uh, firms that you just alluded to are uh, being sued in, in Canada for allowing the use of uh, forced labor. Um, but you know, I, and I can see how that sort of mindset um, in a country like Eritrea can allow uh, certain level of stability. Uh, so it is called the peace, uh, extremely repressed uh, society, uh, have no access to um, information, and most probably uh, you can have a highly normalized, highly pacified society that simply confirms to whatever uh, the state demands of it. But how long can Eritrea continue along these paths? without somewhat opening up, liberalizing, democratizing? Well, that, that's a very good question. I think uh, eventually there will be a re built up resentment. Uh, look at all these young men who are leaving. Uh, their families couldn't be very happy with that. Mm -hmm. So there, I'm sure there's growing resentment. Uh, uh, also the, the way people are treated who do not conform. Uh, we have our own experience at the American embassy uh, because they have compulsory military service. Uh, there were two members of the U.S. Embassy working there, two Eritreans, who refused to go into the army because they're Jehovah's Witnesses, mm. who refused to carry guns, uh, that sort of thing. So they've been in prison now for about eight years. And we don't know if they don't even know if they're alive, you see. So, so that sort of thing builds up resentment over time. And, and it can't, it cannot last indefinitely. But for the moment, there's order, there's money coming in. Uh, a lot of people, more and more people have jobs. And uh, also they don't worry about drought. They have, uh, they have saved water over the years. So it, it is, is being run efficiently, let's put it that way, which is already a benefit. Mm -hmm. and, and your view on, uh, on Kenya? Well, Kenya, I'm more optimistic than our colleague because, well, first of all, I don't know, he was probably too young to remember what we did in 1991 when Arab Moy refused to have a multi-party system. 
and he was putting opposition people in prison for advocating multi-party system, you know, some of the leading intellectuals of Kenya. So the whole international community, United States, World Bank, European Union, France, and the UK, and a given day, we cut off all aid to Kenya, all aid, 100%. He quickly changed and he authorized the multi-party system. And I believe the election of 1992, where Arab Moy won with only 38% of the vote, was a free and fair election. Uh, so we did have some impact on change. And also I believe now that in Kenya, the private sector is more free to do things than it was uh, say under Arab Moy, where you couldn't move grain from one province to another. And it was highly regulated and corrupt. I think private sector, Kenyan private sector is much more free now to do what it needs. And therefore, I, I can't be pessimistic about Kenya. In fact, when I talk on the speaking circuit, I always put Kenya on the list as one of the bright stars. Mm. Mm. Um, <laughs> Mr. Farah, do, do you want to come yes. in? Yes. Yes, yes. I, I, um, I, I actually went into parliament in 1992. So I was part of that uh, reform of efforts in the late 80s and 1991. <coughs> Sorry, and we had uh, we had some two very very able ambassadors. One was Ambassador Hempston, who was an American ambassador. It was not a career diplomat. Is somebody who was appointed at that time? I think by I can't remember who was the American president at the time. Uh, I think it was uh, Bush, Bush the father. It was Bush, Bush, yes, senior Bush, yes, yes. And, 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 and literally broke all uh, diplomatic uh, etiquettes and, and, and protocol and, and literally arm twisted Moy to the extent of almost uh, pulling his arm from its socket. And he did a very good job. We, we owe him a lot. And then there was the uh, German ambassador who also went on a copycat immediately, you know, linked up with the hamstone. So there was, there was a goodwill that time. There was a massive goodwill at that time to to help Africa uh, transform itself into some kind of democracies with human rights components. Uh, but one thing that uh, everybody forgets is that the resilience of authoritarianism is, is you cannot be blind to it. Mm. Uh, you, you, as you put it, when Mobutu, you asked him to have so many parties, he went and created parties himself, which were basically supposed to oppose him. But you know, here he was to defeat what he called the very noble objective that was there. And we've had the same thing. Moi stayed in power for, for 10 years. He left in 2002 because the constitution did not allow him to run for a third time. And, and that goes for all of them. I mean, uh, uh, Museveni went and uh, changed the constitution. He, he removed the term limit. I have a feeling they would do it also. Right now, I don't think uh, Djibouti has a term limit. Museveni has no term limit. Kagame has no term limits. All of them had term limits initially. And I don't know what's in the store for Kenya. We might also have a situation in which people will be, the powers that be could be pushing for term limits. So in, in a sense, the, the authoritarianism that's there in Africa, which, which has very cleverly, very cleverly, uh, 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 meshed both political power as well as economic power in the same hands. The richest people in the country are the leaders of the country. And, and, and in a sense, uh, and like we put it, you see Ambassador Cohen tell, he tells you that the private sector has been very vibrant. I agree with you. The private sector is very vibrant. And all along when we are negotiating human rights, democracy, transparency, openness, credibility in elections and the rest of it, we had a corresponding demands by the developed world. Open up your, your, your mobile phone uh, sector. Open up this sector of the economy. Open up this sector of the economy. So the West also... At the same time, he had his own interests, his own interests, very, very, uh, you know, powerful interests mm. uh, as part of the negotiations. So you never can tell at what stage in those negotiations would our national interest as people of these countries in the whole greater horn would become subordinate to the one or the business or economic mm. or capitalist interests of the Western world. I want to believe every time the two of them, uh, uh, a choice has to be made, we always lost. Mm. And, and and that's why that's why we have we take two steps forward and we take three steps backward. Then of course there was this genocide which happened in Africa using military always 
to subjugate your foes. And then we had the International Criminal Court. I had I was part of the what was called the PGA, Parliamentarians for Global Action, that pushed very hard uh, for the establishment of the Rome Statute or basically the International Criminal Court. Now we had our, our own politicians uh, who were indicted and taken to the International Criminal Court. And they came out of it scot-free, which means that, that, that universal jurisdiction also has now been demystified by, by, by despots and dictators in all other countries in the world, or particularly the third world countries. So it's no longer the teeth that you bear and you threaten them. I, I just wish they never indicted them and just kept on saying that we'll take you to court. Then that, that would have been more fear but right now they were they were subjected to the belly of the beast and they came out of it and and scuff. So everybody knows how to deal with it now and nobody cares about it. So in a sense, we are we are purely at the mercy of those political economic elites who rule these countries. Whether well, you call them despots, call them authoritarians, call them dictators, whatever you want to call them, they can come in the gap of a size of a worky, in which case they are they are they didn't come through a democracy. And I think he's the lesser of all those other devils. Uh, or they could come in a democracy, and this democracy are all managed and you know managed democracies where you know the results well in advance. So it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. I can I can assure you, but uh, we can't lose hope. But uh, mm. uh, the, and, and then there is this uh, massive what do you call hunger and starvation that are there in many parts of the of the continent or in the region for that for that matter. Right now we have about sixty five percent or sixty seven percent of our population subsisting on less than two dollars two dollars a day and you can imagine the level of poverty in the country and then you look at the upper class you look at the at the, at the rich who quite often are also the political class and what they have amassed is unimaginable yeah so and they, they are there yeah on on this point i want to raise um something that recently sort of became very prominent uh, in this region, which is uh, the role of money uh, in politics. Uh, obviously, one of the ways through which most of these leaders maintain and sustain themselves of power is by consolidating uh, patronage. Uh, so uh, certain categories of people from different groups are allowed to succeed economically, and those people are then used to control uh, that particular society. Um, and Alex Duval, um, someone you both probably know, um, an eminent uh, scholar who has done a lot of uh, writing, extensive research on the region, but also have very close personal relationship with some of the leaders, uh, including the late Mother Zenawi, uh, recently uh, wrote a book uh, titled The Real Politics of the Horn of Africa, where he basically talks about the role many played, and in some cases, the role money and um, military power played. So uh, the military in some of these countries engaging, for example, in economic activities and sometimes using the instrument of money and violence to uh, sustain this, uh, these regimes in power. Uh, what, what do you, what do you, what, what, is, what is changing uh, in, in this landscape in terms of the increasing role money is assuming in terms of sustaining this authoritarian apparatus. Ambassador Cohen. Well, uh, when you talk about money, uh, I think you're talking about the United States. You know, we have great inequality here, but uh, I think you're right about Africa. For example, in Ethiopia, companies that are affiliated with the TPLF have all, get all the contracts. The government is gonna build a road or a, a dam or electric power station. Uh, all of these contracts, uh, road transportation, <coughs> that sort of thing, they go to companies which belong to members of the TPLF. So this is the combination of money and political power. So therefore, in order to be able to get anything, you want to get a contract or whatever you want, you want to get a job, you must be loyal uh, to the political party in power. This, this is... Uh, true in many, many uh, African countries. Uh, I always say that one of the reasons that Africa is so far behind the rest of the world is the African entrepreneur who wants to invest his own money but is not affiliated with the people in power. He is considered an enemy of power. Whereas in Southeast Asia, 
the, the independent businessman is seen as a partner in development. There's a tremendous difference of mentality uh, between these two regions. And until the African entrepreneur wants to invest his own money, is seen as a partner in development, they will not get very far. The country I think that is making the most progress now is Ghana. Ghana now you have more and more Africans investing their own money. Uh, the World Bank says that there is over two billion dollars, no, I'm saying two trillion dollars of African money sitting outside Africa. And it's not being invested because of this dichotomy is if you're not part of the power structure, your entrepreneurship is not wanted. And that's why I like Kenya, because I think that's separating now more and more. The entrepreneur does not have to be part of the power structure to make money mm. and to create wealth. Right. Um, I think Ethiopia, in this respect, um, is bringing in what, what, uh, what are called uh, developmental entrepreneurs. Uh, so we have developmental artists, developmental teachers, developmental uh, tradesmen, um, these are some of the ways through which the state creates binaries and boundaries between people who support this policy and people who raise some um, politically uh, critical, consequential questions. Um, again, we'll talk. We'll talk about Ethiopia a, a little bit more, uh, Mr. Farah. Uh, wh wh what's your view on the role of money uh, in in the region? Oh, it is the second most important thing: power and money. And they go together, by the way, so you don't know which is more important than the other. In our elections here, money is everything. And because money is in the monopoly of the of people who are in the government, uh, they, uh, they, they will more power than everybody else. Right. And uh, that's why whenever the moment you access power, the first thing you do in Kenya is to try and amass as much wealth as possible. Mm. And uh, the contracts, like in Ethiopia, uh, by and large, uh, uh, either either graft influenced, which means somebody has to part with some money to be able to be given those contracts, even if it's not politically that well connected, or he has to use political power, or both. So in a sense, there is no way you can divorce money from power in Kenya and in Uganda and in Ethiopia and literally every country in the region. How is money used in Kenya? Is it used to buy votes directly or is it used, for example? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, they buy, they buy the opinion leaders, buy the opinion leaders, and uh, then buy votes also. On the election day itself, there's more money that changes hands in this country than anywhere, anytime, any other time in the years, in those many years, as many years as those uh, that are there. So right. it's, it's, it's not easy. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Okay, and that uh, kind that kind of money kind of money cannot be money that is legitimately made because it runs into uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. So you you it's it's not easy to make that kind of money legitimately. So it has its roots in uh, in in government, and uh, basically one perpetu it perpetuates perpetuates also the whole on power. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I think that is a pretty bleak and a scary picture. Um, I think we'll come oh, yes. back. Oh, yes. we'll, we'll come back at the at, towards the end, and I would uh, like to get your views on uh, uh, what needs to be done if there is any any hope. Uh, I want to zoom in on Ethiopia now, um, Ambassador. Can you see this picture behind me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I got them from uh, your blog. Uh, in Ethiopia, this is. Um, a landmark moment, uh, a turning moment uh, that marked uh, the post derby transition. Uh, um, and you were one of the key player uh, in that meeting uh, with the full weight and power of the United States behind you. I just wanted you to give us a sense of what the power dynamic looked like on that table. As you can see, there is, uh, to my right, uh, Lynch Oleta. Uh, who was the representative of the OLF. And then uh, you have uh, Isaiah Safawarki, uh, president. And then I think it's you. And then Mala Um I don't know who the other person is. Uh, That's uh, Senator uh, Durenberger, former Senator Durenberger. Right, right. President Bush uh, asked him to go along as, a, as his representative for this meeting. Right. Tell us what your role was in that meeting and what the power dynamics looked like on that table. 
Well, uh, in uh, a year earlier, this was May 1991, about mm -hmm. a year earlier, uh, oh, the Soviet Union you know, was supplying a lot of arms and uh, material to the to the Derg, to the government of uh, Mengistu. And they asked us to help bring peace to Ethiopia because they wanted to get out of that obligation because Gorbachev was trying to change the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Instead of spending a lot of money on arms going to the third world, let's spend it on our own citizens. So they said, can you help us bring peace to Ethiopia? So we said, okay, we'll give it a try. Our relations with Ethiopia were not good. Uh, we had not sent us an assistant secretary there for about 10 years before that. So but anyway, I went to see Mengistu and he understood that the Soviets were anxious to get out. So he said, okay, what can we, how can we work? I said, well, why don't you do some media, get into a mediating system situation with the Eritreans who are fighting for independence? And uh, he said, yes. So we asked President Jimmy Carter to do it. And Jimmy Carter went and they did a lot of mediation, but he annoyed Isaias for some reason and Isaias lost confidence in him. So they asked, will you State Department do it? And we started to be mediator. Meanwhile, the other civil war was going on with the TPLF uh, in Tigray mm -hmm. and they got into a mediation with the Italians. So mediation was going on on two levels in two different places. And Toward the end of 1990 or the beginning of 1991, the Ethiopian army started to lose the war on both fronts. The rebels were gaining on both fronts after many, many years of being just static. Nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And we found out after the war that because the State Department came in, the Ethiopian troops said, well, the war is going to be over soon. We don't want to be the last ones to die for Ethiopia. So they stopped fighting very much, allowing the rebels to advance. So that's why we called a meeting because we felt that Addis Ababa was in danger. It, it, we didn't want to see Addis Ababa be destroyed by can fight. I, can I just clarify one thing, because this is really important. What happened between, between those moments? Why is it that the Derg army suddenly began to retreat? What, 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 what is it that changed that power dynamics? Because they saw the US government was doing mediation. They said, well, the US government is very powerful. They're gonna end the war soon. So why should we keep fighting? Well, of course the rebels didn't think that way. The rebels kept fighting. So after about 15 years of, of static warfare, nobody was winning, nobody was losing. They suddenly started to drop back and you found more and more Ethiopian troops running into Addis just to get away from the war, you see. So we, re we really didn't end the war. What we did is we ended the war, but we sat on a soft landing so that we could get some agreements before they start fighting each other. Sometimes I tell the Eritreans, you made a big mistake. You should have captured Addis Ababa. And they always say to me, you're crazy. We're not interested in Addis Ababa. All we want is our own country, you see. But anyway, the reason we had this meeting was to bring everything to a close in a peaceful way so that there should be no more fighting. And that's what we accomplished there. Mm. I, I wanted to get a sense of what the power dynamic looked like on that, on that table, because um, some of the parties are militarily stronger than others. Uh, some of the parties represented uh, a constituency that is broad in, in, in terms of number, in terms of uh, the territory. So uh, Lane Choleta, the OLF representative, uh, represented the Oromo people. Uh, Malazi and I represented the Tigrayan people. If you compare the military uh, power, uh, certainly uh, TPLF were far more uh, stronger and organized. But Lane Choleta represented a far uh, broader uh, constituency in Ethiopia. What was it? So my first question is, what would the power dynamics look like? Um, obviously, Sayas was there. Um, he also had probably the strongest military form uh, uh, among all the three. What, what would the power dynamics look like on, on that table? Well, the, uh, the, the Eritrean rebels were the strongest, and they were getting si significant help from Sudan. Excuse me. <coughs> They get, were getting significant help from Sudan, and therefore they had all the arms that they needed. 
the TPLF was was also not was also pretty strong. Uh, they were also getting help from Sudan. Sudan was helping. They hated Mengistu so much because Mengistu was helping the South Sudan rebels. You see, so he was helping both sides. The Oromo uh, were not really doing much because they really didn't have an organized uh, military force. So we, so the power was really, I would say Melis was the strongest in the sense that he wanted Addis. Isaias was the strongest in the sense that he had the most powerful force, but he wasn't interested in Addis. He was just interested in Asmara. So the day that this meeting began, Asmara already fallen into his hands. He already controlled Asmara. Mm-hmm. And uh, Melis was not far from uh, from Addis, so our our objective was let's end it in a way that could set a transition to a peaceful future for Ethiopia. Now, when we started talking, it was a question of what how to deal with Eritrea's demand for self determination. Mm-hmm. And uh, as soon as we started talking about it, the Oromo gentleman raised his hand and said, we too want a referendum on self-determination. But I said, it's a little late now <laughs> to start talking about a, a Roma, a Roma uh, self-determination. I was sorry about that because I felt that their voice had really never been heard. But our objective was really, let's end this war now, stop the fighting, save Addis from destruction, and get a, a transition where the Eritrean situation can be settled. So they, they agreed on a three year transition and then a, then a referendum. What, what was what was uh, Melissa's response to uh, Lencho's uh, claim for self determination? If Melissa's eye was fastened on Addis Ababa, uh, if Oromo was forced to exercise their right to self determination, and in the event, for example, they decide to go their own separate ways, uh, Addis Ababa might end up going with them because Addis Ababa is located in the heart of. Uh, That's right. Well, it was at such a late hour that we just ignored it. We just ignored it and went ahead with the, I, I'm sorry about that. I consider that one of my uh, mistakes. We should really give in better consideration to the Oromo. And we were not prepared for Oromo to speak up. What, why was that? Well, we had no contacts with Oromo prior. We were seeing Melish in Khartoum. We were seeing Isaias in Khartoum. They were both traveling to the United States. But the Oromos were, were quiet. We didn't hear much from them. Only mm-hmm. in, and when we had the London conference, the Oromos suddenly spoke up. Right, right. Um, I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, 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 I can see, you know, uh, there is this talk that uh, when uh, Roosevelt, Stalin, and, uh, and uh, uh, Churchill were meeting in Yalta, just before the end of the first, Second World War. Uh, one of them suggested that the Pope should also have a role in, in, in determining the new world order. And Stalin asked them, how many divisions does the, does the Pope have? <laughs> <laughs> so at that time, much as the Oromos are about 55 to 60% of the population of Ethiopia, and, and the Somalis who had been militarized before the, through the Ogaden Liberation Front and the Western Somali Liberation Front, did not pose any military challenge that time to the center. They had already, the military challenge had already been blunted much earlier. So they, 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 did, not, they did not constitute any, any military challenge. So basically they were, they were left out of the deal. And it's only now that the Oromos and, and, and even the Somalis are seeing the need for them to assert themselves in the manner, in the manner that the Tigrayans and the, and the Eritreans had asserted themselves. But, uh, the problem was never solved. I can I can assure you because the mm. problem is still, uh, and, and and then of course if the Oromos were supposed we were allowed to have a self determination, then you're talking about what is it over fifty percent of the country, the landmass, because uh, all the way to from Addis Ababa, you're only left with Gojam, Gondar, and and the Afar region and 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 Ogaden. That's all. The rest of it is Oromo. So mm. uh, it's it's uh, I don't know whether that- the whether the Oromos would want a situation like that, or they would want to have a, a system that is so fair and credible that they, nothing stops them from becoming the prime minister or the president of uh, Ethiopia. I mean, those mm. are probably things that Lenjalat and others had in mind at that time. Mm. Um, G- given, given, given also the fact that they, they are the, probably the, 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 the worst historically subjugated people uh, next to the 
next to the to the uh, uh, Americans, uh, Africans who are taken <laughs> into bondage and slavery in the Americas, because the Amara Tigray axis has has dominated the the Romos for well over three hundred years, and in in the most brutal manner. Uh, I mean, so much so that uh, uh, maybe at one stage. The, the impression given is that the Oromos should be Amaranized, you know what I mean, or Semitized. Uh, I mean, that's when they, they started assuming their names and everything else. But it's, it's one of the, it's one of the, the darkest uh, parts of the African continent when you try and understand the feudalism and the kind of uh, pogroms that were carried out against them, yeah. I, I, I want to, again, go back to this this moment because um, this is a very critical moment that helped define, I think, the path that Ethiopia has taken for the last 25, 26 yes. years. Yes, um, yeah. um, I was just wondering, Ambassador Cohen, whether you had a sense at that moment when, and, and also, I think, from your own encounters and relationships with, with some of the key people uh, within TPLF and, and Eritrea, whether we had a sense that um, the Ethiopian state would turn into uh, the kinds of uh, the kind of um, um, extremely repressive authoritarian states that it has become, um, did, did you have a sense, any any doubts uh, at that moment, or were they so impressive that uh, the Americans, including yourself, uh, trusted them? Well, uh, Malish was a very smooth operator. And, you know, we, we had this agreement in May, end of May, 1991. And in July, he called an all parties meeting in Addis, all political parties, all nationalities, all tribes, all ethnic groups met in, uh, in Addis for a meeting to discuss the future of Ethiopia. And it was all democracy. We were talking about how everybody will have a voice and, I came there with my delegation and uh, it was the first time that I ever had to have a special security guard for me because the State Department said that so many people hate you because of what happened in London that you're, you're in danger. So I, I went there and, but it was all very, you know, everybody's gonna have, demo gonna have democracy. So Mellish made all sorts of promises, but then of course, drifted into this authoritarian regime. I remember talking to him later, uh, just on the question of land ownership, for example. You know, the uh, under the Ethiopian farmer cannot own his land. He can only occupy it during his lifetime and he could send it, he can have his children take over when he dies, but he's never owned it. So he can't go to the bank and borrow money to buy machinery or whatever. So I questioned him about that. I said, this is not a good system. You're never gonna get agricultural production if the farmer cannot invest money. He says, yes, but look what will happen if we give them ownership. The Amharas will, he said, Amhara. He said, the Amharas will come in here. They'll buy the land for nothing. And the, the, the previous owner, the previous owners, the peasants, they will, dissipate the money within one year, they'll become poor serfs again, and the Amharas will be in control, just like they were under the emperor, you see. So this, he was expressing a resentment against what the, the many century rule of the Amharas, you see. And he says, the only way we can keep the Amharas from coming back is if we do the same thing. We have the authoritarian regime when only we will be in charge. So of course, I being a non-expert on Ethiopia, uh, I, I finally, a light bulb went on in my head and I said, this is the cultural makeup of Ethiopia. <laughs> this is the way they think. Mm. <laughs> what? Yeah, it, yeah, it, it's, uh, I, I wanted to ask, uh, well, I'll come back to this same, same uh, because I don't know if uh, Ambassador knows about the feudal system that it, uh, Ethiopia operated on before. When, when, when all the land belongs to the Amara nobility and the Oromos were supposed to till that land, same land, yeah. and take maybe 70% of the products from those, that land to the right. noble families. And what, what, what is basically now in hindsight uh, has become not quite a, a, a rosy picture. Is you have to understand that Afawarki and Meles were, were relatives after all. 
because the, the highland Eritreans, the Hamasen, Golugzai, Sarai, and the Tigray are more or less the same people. They have a lot in common. Same language. And the same language, the same culture, same what do you call uh, uh, Orthodox uh, faith. And they have a history together. Um, and, and you know, the, the, although, although the rivalry between the Amaras and the Tigray is, is there, but you have to understand when it comes to Oromos and all what is assumed to be the lesser races in Ethiopia, they, they form one Semitic uh, component. Yeah. And that's why, and that's why uh, Afwarki assisted Meles in stabilizing the rest of Ethiopia because the Eritreans were much better disciplined and better armed and better trained and, and bigger in numbers as far as the rebels were concerned. Uh, it's only later on, much later, with the, 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 the ego and the supremacy battles between themselves. Uh, it turned into that uh, very sorry state when they had to fight one another. The other one question I wanted to ask uh, Ambassador is, the same method you tried to help the Eritrea, the Ethiopian, so that uh, Addis Ababa does not become a battleground and there is no total collapse of the state in, in, in Ethiopia. Uh, why, why didn't you try the same for Somalia when it was uh, going through the same phase? Have you tried that for Somalia also as, as, as the only superpower of those days? You mean in 1991 when Siad Bar yes. was... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, to, well, bring, that, to, bring the rebels, to bring the rebels together so that Mogadishu could not go into the chaos it went into and maybe talk to Siad Bar and move him out the same way you talked very well to Mangistu and, and gave him a plan to move to Zimbabwe. Yeah, that... That was interesting. I think that was a victim of U.S. strategic interests. Uh, we needed Berbera for our fleet to operate out of, and we, we didn't want to get uh, Siad Bari agitated. Plus, his personality was the type that it was hard for him to get him to think about talking to the other ones. He kept saying, the Ethiopians are going to attack me every time I saw him. Oh, the Ethiopians are coming. I said, the Ethiopians are not coming. There are Somalis living in Ethiopia who are going to come after you, meaning the people from Hargeza, that's those people. Yes, yes. So he was not amenable to some sort of a, of a peace uh, operation there. He was, his mentality just didn't accept that. Mm. Plus, we had the Italians. The Italians, for some reason, kept pressing us to keep, keep helping uh, Siad Bar. I didn't quite understand that, but the, that was their attitude. And that was difficult for us to, uh, to deny them. Do, do, you, do, you feel, do you feel the American, American strategic interest has since shifted? Because uh, we were hoping that Americans, okay, you had the oppression restore hope when the, the American Marines came into Somalia to try and help in the delivery. Let's, let's, let's take up this question uh, towards the end. Uh, we, we can uh, sort of... Yeah, well, look, I'm this. sorry, I, I, can't re I can't stay much longer. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm concluding. I'm concluding. I just want to focus on two questions. One is the current crisis uh, within the ruling party. Uh, Mullis uh, installed himself first as a president uh, shortly after uh, that meeting, uh, and then uh, a prime minister, uh, and he remained in power until his days in, in 2012. Um, given the way in which he structured the party, he ran the country, um, he left behind such a huge vacuum without uh, any um, uh, strategic uh, thinker, uh, leader that can fill uh, that, that vacuum. Uh, he has to do that precisely because um, retaining the kind of authoritarian control that he wanted to retain uh, necessitates the elimination of every viable or credible uh, uh, leader. Uh, now the, the, the ruling party is in crisis and there is internal uh, infighting uh, within the ruling party. Uh, are members of the diplomatic community, the international community interested in terms of democratizing this party? Is there, is there any discussion that you are aware of? I'm not aware of, uh, I think the Obama people did not take many initiatives there, to the best of my knowledge, since I'm not an insider. Uh, and I think the, uh, the Trump people are just emphasizing human rights. They're not really looking at the internal dynamics. Uh, what I'm trying to work on track two is to 
to normalize between Eritrea and Ethiopia. I think it's in their mutual interest to do that. And uh, the, the Eritreans are now positive about that, they've told me. But the Ethiopians are sort of, yeah, one day yes, one day no. Uh, but I think if you look at the speech made by the Ethiopian delegate to the UN when they renewed sanctions on Eritrea, they said, yes, we must renew sanctions, but we're looking forward to having good relations with Eritrea. So I think maybe things can be changing there. But as terms of working within Ethiopia to push them toward democracy and to take care of this instability in the TPLF, which is really falling apart, I agree with you. And the way I see it is that the EPRDF is falling apart because all of these governors that they've installed in the states are now becoming pro, pro states and anti Addis, you see, anti Tigrayan. So uh, it is time maybe to, to try and work things out inside the TPLF and get them to accept democracy. Mm. But as far as I know, the Americans are not taking any initiatives there. Mm. For the moment. Just as someone who has been um, in the State Department and understands the mindset, and the culture of the diplomatic community, uh, should the Ethiopian people um, expect some kind of positive um, outcome or a positive role to be played by, by the U.S., especially from this administration? Uh, I don't know. I think uh, Secretary Tillerson is very new. He's traveling there soon. He may, I think he might take an interest. He might take an interest if he's properly briefed. Mm -hmm. I hope he's properly briefed. But the new, you know, our assistant secretary of state now is, was formerly ambassador in Ethiopia, uh, Don Yamamoto. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think he will brief Tillerson about what's going on there. So I think we can be a bit optimistic. Mr. Farah, what do you make of the sort of the crisis uh, within the ruling party? Well, I think uh, basically what 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 was expected uh, as as a result, or rather as a product of the crisis itself, is some form of a true democracy in which uh, the will of the people is going to be respected at the end of it. But the way I see it myself is just going to be some kind of a reconfigured autocracy. You know, uh, the the the. <laughs> The, the same same players will might change faces here and there, uh, but but the the way I see it is at the moment the the Tigray the fissures within the Tigray power elite itself is healed one way or the other, which they are likely to come together the moment they see the threat the bigger threat from 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 the from the larger Oromo Oromo configuration. I I have a feeling that they will play they can't play hardball with them anymore but they will play a smart ball. Right now, they have created a conflict between the Oromo region and the Somali region. And they're likely to do that within a number of other regions as a destruction, basically. So I, I, I think they're working out how they could uh, revalidate themselves and renew their own worth uh, without giving much and look like they've given anything out. So, mm -hmm. so it's, 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 that's the way, you know, the, the Marxist and Leninist kind of autocracy has reshaped itself or reconfigured itself in latter years. Look at Putin. I mean, he comes in as a prime minister, then comes in as a president, then changes here and there. And, and uh, the, the rule is the same. I mean, I don't see any difference between uh, Putin. I actually see him a uh, much smarter and, and a sharper and more efficient uh, Brezhnev. Uh, you see what I mean? So, so basically, I think the, the Tigray uh, axis will, will at some stage come together because then uh, they realize that uh, they, they can't stay in that inter internal strife for too long. And the moment they come together, they, they will play their games with the rest of the nationalities in the country. And I have a feeling the, 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 uh, uh, Ethiopia is still faced with a long uh, period in which uh, uh, nothing much is going to change in any substantive way. Hmm. Final thoughts, uh, Ambassador Cohen. Um, what are the two most important things that need to change in the region? in order for the region not to slide into complete collapse of the states? Well, I think uh, the biggest tragedy right now is South Sudan. You know, South Sudan uh, 
terrible mistakes were made there. They had a six year transition where nothing was done to build institutions, to, to train people to run government. And South Sudan never had colonialism. They just had slave traders in charge there. So it was inevitable that it would collapse. So South, South Sudan must be taken over by the UN for at least 10 years to, to get everything right. So that's priority number one. Priority number two, I think I agree with you, is to persuade the people at the T TPLF they have to broaden the base and they have to really accept democracy, even though they would, as a minority, they will lose power. But they have to do it in such a way that they will, it will truly be democratic when everyone will, will feel secure. I think that's priority number two. Otherwise, Ethiopia will continue to deteriorate. And maybe ultimately collapse. It could collapse, yes. Um, Mr. Farah, what are the two things that you think needs to be done, needs to change? Um, if this region were to return from this abyss, uh, the cliff that it is standing on at the moment? Well, we are looking, the region, the region is very diverse. I mean, the kind of problems that you have in Somalia, in uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea, what you call the Afro-Asiatics, basically, and, and Djibouti to some exchange, are pretty much interrelated, although for the for the for for now Djibouti is uh, is fairly stable, and and I, there's need to see this one holistically. Uh, on on the issue of uh, South Sudan, I think it's it's a long haul. I mean, you we have to get. This is a very tribal society, and as you put, as Ambassador Cohen puts it, they haven't had a period of time to to be able to to learn in 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 in. in how to basically establish or promote institutions in that place. And, and the Dinka, Nuer, Shiluk, and all these other uh, uh, Juba tribes and the rest of them is, 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 is a bit tricky. Uh, I, I, I don't see a, um, a light at the end of the tunnel for South Sudan for a short, for a long while to come. But I think the rest of the region is pretty tired. I'm talking about Ethiopia, uh, Somalia, and Eritrea. So if, if there is uh, conferences to discuss that and, 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 and a bare knuckle pro conferences in the sense that there's no more, you know, hide and seek or chicken games there, which the Semitic uh, Axis had played for a very long time. And which also in Somalia, uh, uh, Ambassador had already mentioned it, was, was pretty much right before. I think there's chance that uh, this, this group can come together and, 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 and basically get how to promote certain institutions. The problems are not typical from one end to the other, but they're interrelated. Ethiopia's uh, instability it has a powerful effect, or stability, even for that matter, on Eritrea, on Somalia, and on, on, on Djibouti, if they choose to do that. Right now, they can't choose to do that because of the only outlet they have. So, so I think there is need for that kind of a broad conferences to happen, in which, uh, even if need be, reshaping of boundaries has to be done in these countries, then so be it. Uh, if it's going to be the only thing that will bring a lasting peace and a lasting harmony and lasting enableness, then some, we might as well do that. But uh, uh, there has to be some serious conferences on that. Uh, and, and I think uh, that is one area. Ambassador Cohen and, and many other people in the, who have influences in America, I don't know how much influence he has right now under Trump, but who have influences in America to can try and initiate. Some very bold, honest, upfront open discussions on the future of the region itself in, in those areas because uh, it's an implosion uh, although the, the the semitic axis will still maintain power in ethiopia uh, but no doubt there's going to be there's a serious violence that's going to take place because the romos are not taking this line down anymore uh, and that implosion will have an effect on the countries in the neighborhood there's no doubt about that mm -hmm. and obviously the people on the ground also must continue uh, putting the pressure on the government because uh, it's only if there are people who are asking these questions making these demands uh, that others that are beyond their shores will listen um, in some cases and, and absolutely will absolutely uh, yeah absolutely um, Gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Cohen uh, from Washington, D.C., uh, Mr. Farah uh, Malim from uh, Nairobi, Kenya, 
Uh, thank you so much for joining me here on Conversations and Ideas. Uh, thank you to those uh, viewing us, uh, commenting, interacting uh, on social media. Uh, until we come back with another program, goodbye. Kwaheri Akwanana. Kwaheri Ambassador, thank you very much. The last time we met was when we had the Millennium Peace